And so today we are in a series called Life, Money, and Hope, and we're continuing this series, and this series is all about, um, all about money. That's correct. That's right. Oh, why do you have to talk about money in a church? Because Jesus talks more about money than heaven and hell combined. But I'm going to just give you a little uh, fair warning. If you're looking for someone to tell you to give $100 and God gave you $10,000 back, this is the wrong church. This is not about the slot machine of heaven. This is not about a give to get more. This is giving because God gave to us. And it's about the freedom that he gives us. And today's going to be a hard message. I'm going to ask you to um, put your seatbelts on because uh, I'm going to be sharing some things that are very controversial. And I'm not sharing them. The Word of God is sharing them. And so please understand that we believe the Word of God. We just spoke about the Word of God. Um, how long in that series? Our final authority is the Word of God. And so we'll be talking about what God has to say about money, what God has to say about wealth. But you know what? The most important thing about us is our hearts. It's not what happens to us. It's what happens in us, which is the most important. And so we want to make sure our hearts are right. Before we get into material possessions, before we get into spending and giving, it's so much more important that God has captured our hearts. And so this is what we're going to be doing today. This is what we're talking about money, okay? So let's get right into it. And 1 Timothy 6, 9, 10 through 11 says the following. But those who desire to be rich. Now let's be honest. Who does not want to be rich? If someone came to you and said, I have a million dollars, what do you say? Thank you. <laughs> One honest person. Yeah, we all desire to get rich. Why? Why we talk about, why does the Bible talk about so much about money? Ever wonder why? Let me tell you the reason why. Benjamin Franklin said something very profound. He said, time is the stuff life is made of. Time is the stuff life is made of, right? Time represents your life. Now, let me ask you a question. When you work for a company or employer, what, an, an employer, what do you give? You give your time, and what do you get exchanged for? Money. So you spend your time, and you get money back, okay? You give your time, you get money. So if time is the stuff your life's made of, what do you spend your time on? Money. So your life is, is interconnected with life. See that? That's why it's such a, you know, you spend your time and you get money back. So there's an exchange that takes place. And this is why money will often dictate and is a good barometer and a good um, a journal of where our hearts are. But the problem is we don't realize what we're living in. Listen to this. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation. Being rich is not the problem. Fall into temptation, a snare. And a the snare there is like almost like a trap. We, a trap, you don't know it's there. You're walking along your way, and there's a bear trap. You don't even know it's there. So it's not like people say, I'm going to fall into sin. I'm going to leave God for my job. I'm going to give everything to money. No. What happens is you progressively kind of move away, not knowing what's going on, firing the desire to be rich that becomes the most important thing in our minds, and it even begins to color how we look at God. I can look through God as my rich daddy who wants to bless me, and it's all about me. And what can happen is you can be in a twist strip scriptures, you can twist church, twist your life, and you fall into the snare. And what happens? Into many senseless and harmful desires. The desire to control that plunge people into ruin and destruction. It's not the money, it's the love of money, it's the desire for control. For the love of money, see, it's not money that's evil, it's the what? The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Why is the love of money the root of evil? Because money represents control. The more money you have, the more options you have. Correct? Absolutely. You get sick, it doesn't need no good, does it? But you know what I'm saying. The more money you have, the more options, more control. So really, it's not about money. It's about control. That's the truth. That's the truth. So the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving, it's a craving, I must have it, that some have wandered away from the faith. Wandered. Again, it's not like you just choose, I'm not going to follow God. It's just a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit here. It's like putting salt in a stew. You don't even realize, before you know it, it's got too much sodium in it, right? You just a little sprinkle here, a little sprinkle there, and before you know it, the whole broth of your life has been changed to something different than what God would have for you. They wandered away from the faith, and they have pierced themselves. Jesus was pierced. Why should we pierce ourselves with our finances? 
And what happens to us is we, now we're, we live beyond our means. We do. We live beyond our means. And what happens is our culture, our cult, we mentioned last week, our culture, we have like $20 trillion of national debt. I can't even wrap my mind about that. Remember we said, if you're making 80 grand a year and you're spending $125,000, $130,000 a year, that's kind of what our government is doing. And then what happens is you become a slave to the machine. Now I work to pay the bills, right? So the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It's through this craving that some have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. All right, now this is the truth. A household income of 45000 per year would qualify us as being the top 1% in the world. Do you realize that? We keep hearing about 1%ers. Guess what? In the world economy, you and I are 1%ers. So we're all rich. We are. We're, I don't feel rich. You are rich. We can know what the problem is. We compare to somebody else. I've been to places in the world that they, they have no running water. They have mud walls, clay ovens. It's, it, I'm telling you, we are rich. And we are the one percenters, but we don't see it. Because there's always something. There's, there's a spirit called Jimmy. Give me, give me. My name is Jimmy. If your name is Jimmy, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I felt, okay, this is what's going on. So we're rich. And, and so a lot of people, there was a survey a couple years ago at, that was given anonymously. What would you be willing to do for $10 million? And people were being honest. They took their mask off. They don't have to worry about what people are going to say about them. And these are some of the answers. Some of them are funny and some of them are quite sad. This is what they said. 25% would have been in their entire family. After Thanksgiving, can I hear an amen? <laughs> hey. 23% would, would prostitute for a week. I'm not making this stuff up. 16% would give up their U.S. citizenship. 10% would lie to let a murderer go free. So in a court of law, if you know the person was guilty, if you give me 10 million bucks, I'll let them go free. And here's a sad one. 7% would kill a stranger for 10 million bucks. And my personal favorite, 3% would put their children up for adoption. <laughs> okay. Some of you are saying, I'll do it for free, thank you. No, I love our kids. But you know, the truth is, why would we make these why would we make immoral choices for? Why? Because we want to be God. Money is a good test to show who's God in your life. Money is the love of money is the root of all evil. Let me just share something that's not on my notes, but I need to share it. Uh, is this. Um, I don't know if you realize this, but in the end times is coming. The Bible says we will not be able to buy or sell without the mark of the beast. Let's, let them calculate the number. It's 666. Six, six. An unholy trinity. Six is the number of man. Six, six. And you will not be able to buy or sell unless you give into the economy that's going on. Now, what's happening to us right now? I have to have this, I have to have that, I have to do this, I have to do that. And we start living for the economy. And everything, that's, why could a person make these horrible choices? Because they're living for the economy. Now listen to this. Solomon, the wisest man that ever was, according to the Bible, he was wise. God appeared to him twice. Twice. At the end of his life, there was, in Chronicles, it talks about how much gold he had. Guess how much gold he had? One, one year, he had 666 talents of gold, 666. It's not an accident that he had 666 talents of gold. You know why? That shows that he was worshiping money. That spirit that brought Solomon down is bringing America down. It's the desire to have. It's the desire to control. And if we're not careful, we will be under the Antichrist spirit because we want to worship 666 money. It's not the money. It's called control, comfort. I want to master my own destiny. This is why we can make the choices like that. So, that being said, we talked about this. We're called to be blessed. God wants to bless us. He wants to bless us. In fact, we mentioned last week that we are part of the Abrahamic covenant, that we, the Bible says, if you're a child of God and you give your life to Jesus Christ, you are heirs of the promise of Abraham. So all the promises that God has given Abraham, you and I have. 
So God wants to bless us. And I will make you a great nation. God wants to make us a great ethnos people. He does. And he wants to bless you and make your name great so that you can spend it on all the things that you want to get. No, so that we could be a what? Blessing. My friends, you and I are banks. God puts his money in the banks of you and I. And he wants us to make deposits to release, to take care of our families, to take care of people, to change the world. There's nothing wrong with having nice things. There's nothing wrong with helping people. But ultimately, it's not our money. It's not our money. It's God's. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, your life is not your own. You've been bought with a price. Glorify God in your body. Okay? So we talked about being blessed and what it means to be blessed. Number one, we talk about the slot in church. Be generous, be generous, be generous, be generous. And, uh, and that's really important to be generous. But if you're generous and are spending more than you're bringing in, it's hard to be generous. It's hard to help other people if you have nothing to give. So you can give all you want, but if you're spending more than you got, how are you supposed to, yeah, you're freeing that one. That's good. It's like one leg of the tripod. Or one leg of, one leg, you one leg we mentioned last week. I'm not going to do it again. Well, actually, I'll do it one for you. If you have this nailed into the floor, you can't go anywhere, right? You need, it takes two legs to walk. And so generosity is one leg we often talk about in the church. The second one is stewardship. How wise. Now, let me just tell you a basic, I'm not a financial planner. But if you type 10%, save 10% and live on 80, you're doing phenomenal. That's real simple. That's one, that's one example. Stewardship is managing what God has given you, realizing it's not yours. There's a problem when it's yours. Let me say something. You're not designed to be an owner. You're a loner and not an owner. It's on loan. What you, what you, do, what you own, you do alone. God has not designed you to live on your own. God has not designed you to control things. You are a manager. It's always been that way. When we go against that principle, you do damage to your design. You do damage to your DNA. You do damage to your mind. You do damage to your emotions. You do damage to relationships. We're not designed to own. We're only designed to steward. And so when we begin to own things, it destroys us. It does not work. It's a faulty cell. It's like a cancer cell. That if you let it metastasize, and selfishness, and I'm telling you right now, I don't like this message. I know. I don't like it either until I read it and realize, wait a minute, this is the freedom we're looking for. Okay? So we want to be blessed to be a blessing. So if, if, a, if I put my money in a bank and they lose my money, am I going to put my money in that bank? Of course not. Well, it's, it's, it's guaranteed. I know it's guaranteed since the Great Depression. Just for the sake of an argument here. If I, if I put a, a $1,000 in the bank and I try to withdraw this, oh, we don't have the money, we spent it. Am I going to put any more money in that bank? Of course not. Okay? So, I want to talk about King Nebuchadnezzar in a second. Great guy. Great king. One of the greatest kings that ever was. Babylon. We talk about, ever hear the horror of Babylon? <laughs> yeah. The Bible talks about the revelation. Babylon often represents wealth, power, and dominion. Well, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, he was the greatest uh, king in the Babylonian Empire, which is in today in, in um, Iraq area. Saddam Hussein built, a temp, built his palace right next to the ruins, is trying to rebuild Babylon. Babylon is an amazing city, about the size, according to, about size of Chicago. The city is enormous, and, and he had everything you can imagine. I'm just going to show you a little bit of a, give an idea how wealthy, if you can show that, how wealthy and how amazing he was. This is a little bit what he experienced. This is like a, a, obviously not the real one, a model of it. But you can see the temple in the middle there, the palace. I mean, look at all the wealth. A matter of fact, this is in the British Museum, that gate, that first gate, there's in the British Museum. But all through the city, I mean, it's like America. He had everything he could ever want. Look at incredible blue stone, which is extremely expensive, has copper in it. He had this thing called the Hanging Gardens which is one of the seventh wonders of the world. I mean, amazing. Uh, they're still trying to find it, but it was incredible. And he built it for his wife, who tried to go back to her homeland. It was an absolutely amazing place. People from around the world admired him. And an incredible kingdom he had. He had aqueducts, he had rivers, he had walls. I mean, it was incredible. It was an incredible city, even from today's standards. 
It was absolutely amazing. And my friends, you and I live in a Babylon today. America's a great country. We have all these wonderful things. We have computers in our pockets. We have money. We have transportation. I mean, he had it all, everybody. He had everything. Can you imagine if you had control of all of that? Imagine if everyone had an answer to you, all money, all decisions had to run through you, and you owned all that. That's a lot of power, is it not? Can you imagine that? Having all of that power? Well, that's what Nebuchadnezzar had. He had all that and more. He was amazing. He was an incredible leader, incredible king, incredible military strategy. He would conquer things. And what happened was, in 584, uh, 5, um, 584, I believe it was, uh, they, he sacked Jerusalem and took captive the J Jewish people. And he brought them to Babylon. Okay, Nebuchadnezzar. He brought my shack, your shack, and a bungalow. Shack, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember those guys? And Daniel. They were young. And uh, he wanted people to worship a statue. They wouldn't do it. You heard the story. that There was three in the fire. And he saw a fourth man. Later on, he has a dream where he sees this great statue. And he's freaking out. He's so scared. He just what he says. It's incredible. He tells people, hey, listen, I need you to tell me what I dreamt and the meaning of it. Okay. He tells us enchanters and astrologers and fortune tellers. He says, I want, I want to know what I dreamt. And they're like, King, can you tell us what you dreamt? I'm not going to tell you what I dreamt. You tell me what I dreamt. Can you imagine that? And so he says, I'm going to wipe you all out. So he puts an edict to kill all the wise people in, and kill all the wise people in his kingdom. Daniel hears about it as a young man, says, we got to do something about this. And he begins to pray, and, and God says, I'll give you the interpretation. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you what I dreamt and the interpretation. He goes to, I mean, amazing, he goes to Nebuchadnezzar. He's bold enough to go with the word of the Lord. Are we bold enough to go with the word of the Lord? He goes right to the king and shares a prophetic vision of what's going to happen about the kingdoms of the earth, which we can read about in Daniel today. He makes him powerful. He became one of the highest people in Babylon. Okay? Years go by. 10, 15 years go by. Now he comes to another place where he has another dream. And he's, he's destitute and afraid. And what does he do? He goes to his suit. You'll see in a second. So we have King Nebuchadnezzar. He actually... King of, uh, I, I've invited... Nebuchadnezzar today to come in and to preach to us. Is that okay? Okay, I've actually invited him to come today. No, I'm not calling back a spirit, but I'm actually, I'm actually going to read what he wrote. It's amazing. He's going to speak to us today because this guy understands what wealth is. He understands what power is. He understands the insanity of it all and the right way to get your mind back. King Nebuchadnezzar sent this message to the people of every race and nation and Cheshire and Southington, oh, and language, Throughout the world, peace and prosperity to you. Hey, I like that. I want you all to know about the miraculous signs and wonders the Most High God has performed for me. You want to look at Daniel 4. I know you can't see it in the side. We'll figure it out next week. Most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs. How powerful are his wonders. His kingdom will last forever. His rule through all generations. He's bragging on God. All right, we're not done. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was living in my palace in comfort and prosperity. But one night, I had a dream that frightened me. Guys, can you see stuff? I don't know about you, but I see things that are happening in our culture that frighten me. When I read the news, I'm frightened. When I see the lack of love for people and the violence in our streets and all these things, it frightened, it frightened him. His dream frightened him. I saw visions that terrified me as I lay in my bed. He had night terrors. So I issued an order calling all the wise men of Babylon so they could tell me what my dream meant. When all the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and fortune tellers came in, and, and I told them the dream, but they could not tell me what it meant. Listen, there, why is there astrologers, palm readers, tarot card readers almost in every town? Maybe some of you have visited them. People are looking to know the supernatural. The problem is everything supernatural is not God. There are evil spirits out there. Ouija boards, tarot cards. It's like an angel of light. He comes to tell you things. And you think it's hard for a demon to look on Google and see who your grandfather was? The demons have their own Google. Oh, when you were five years old, you had a matchbox car that was purple. 
They, I mean, I can do that with this. I can look at your Facebook and see that Matchbox car. And so people will give themselves to these demons. And they think, oh, this is okay. They're deceiving spirits. And so the church should be the place where we have such integrity that if people want to know the truth, they come to the church, not to an astrologer, okay? I could not tell me what it meant. At last, Daniel came in before me, and I told him a dream. I believe as the supernatural begins to rise up in our culture, we need to function in the power of the Spirit in relationship with the Holy Spirit in and through the Son by the power of God. We need these things. We're not going to be running around being weird, but God wants to release his power on us, everybody. Okay, that's for another time. But I believe the church should be a place where we see God's miraculous power. He was named Belshazzar after my God. He changed Daniel's name. And the enemy always wants to change your name, by the way. He wants to change your identity. The first thing the enemy goes after is your identity. Remember that. But you must remember who you are. And the spirit of the holy gods in him. I said to him, Belshazzar, chief of the magicians, I know that the spirit of the holy gods, plural, which is wrong, is in you, and that no mystery is too great for you to solve. He's giving the story. Now tell me what my dream means. While I was lying in my bed, this is what I dreamed. I saw a large tree in the middle of the earth. The tree grew very tall and strong, reaching high into the heavens for all the world to see. It had fresh green leaves. It was loaded with fruit for all to eat. Wild animals lived in its shade and birds nested in its branches. And all the world was fed from its tree. Then as I lay there dreaming, I saw a messenger, a holy one coming down from heaven. The messenger shouted, cut down the tree and lop off its branches. Shake off its leaves and scatter its fruit. In other words, destroy the, destroy the tree and any remnant of the tree. Chase the wild animals from its shade and birds from its branches, but leave the stump and its roots in the ground, bound it with a band of iron. Iron was the strongest known metal at that time, and bronze surrounding it by tender grass. In other words, it's what's decreed is what's decreed. There's nothing you can do about it. So he's freaking out from this, this uh, dream. Until the dew of heaven, let him live with it, wild animals, among plants in the field for seven periods, seven years of time. Let him have the mind of a wild animal instead of the mind of a human. For this has been decreed by the messengers. It is commanded by the holy ones so that everyone may know that the most high rules over the kingdoms of the world. He gives them to anyone he chooses. Listen, our earth, it may seem like it's out of control, but God controls who is in power. He allows it. He allows uh, Barack Obama to be president. He allowed Donald Trump to be president. He allows a, um, uh, Vladimir Putin to be the president of Russia. I don't like it either, but he allows these things. It's not out of his control. Though it may seem like it is, it's not. He allows it because he gives freedom to us. For this has been decreed by the messengers and commanded by the holy ones, so that everyone may know the Most High rules over the kingdoms of the world. He gives them to anyone he chooses, even the lowliest of people. Belshazzar, that was the dream that I, King Nebuchadnezzar, had. Now tell me what it means. There are going to be people, when things get difficult in the planet, in our country, what's the answer? The Bible says be ready in season and out of season to give the, what? The hope that you have. Is our hope built on Jesus Christ? Are we living in a mirage? Are we living for wealth? Are we living for this culture? Are we living for God? And so Daniel knew. Now tell me what it means. For none of the wise men of my kingdom can do so. I'm telling you right now. God's power, God's grace, God's ingenuity should always be better in the church than in the world. Because we're people of God. But you can tell me because the spirit of the holy gods are in you. Upon learning this, Daniel, also known as Belshazzar, was overcome for a time, frightened by the meaning of the dream. He knew what it meant. Then the king said to him, Belshazzar, don't be alarmed by the dream and what it means. Belshazzar replied, I, this is what he says, I wish the events, Daniel says, this is Daniel, I wish the events foreshadowed in this dream would happen to your enemies, my lord, and not to you. Daniel was rooting for Nebuchadnezzar? Let me say something. You cannot win someone you hate for Christ. If you hate people that are not believers, you can't win them. 
You can hate what they do. You can hate the destruction, but you cannot hate. You cannot save what you hate. And so we should love people, warn people, care for people. We can't be hating people. Now, I know the word hate is thrown around. If you disagree with someone, you're a hater. That's like a three-year-old saying, you hate me. No, I'm not talking about that. But you can't save someone you hate. Jesus looked at the crowds and loved them. And look at Daniel, not to you. He wanted the betterment of society. And he lived under a tyrannical king. That tree, your majesty, is you. For you have grown strong and great. Your greatness reaches up to the heavens and your rule to the ends of the earth. This is what the dream means, your majesty, and what the Most High has declared will happen to the Lord my King. He tells him what's going to happen. You will be driven from human society and you will live in the fields with the wild animals. You will eat grass like a cow. Not smoke grass, but probably the same reaction. can cause psychosis, by the way. And you will be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven periods of time, seven years, will pass while you live this way until you learn that the Most High rules over the kingdoms of the world and gives them to anyone. Do we realize that God rules over the world or do we think we rule over the world? But the stump and roots of the tree were left in the ground. This means that you will receive your kingdom back again when you have learned that heaven rules, King Nebuchadnezzar, please accept my advice. Guys, God rules, we don't. This is not ours. You're not designed to own anything. Please understand that. I'm not talking about communism. I'm talking about biblicalism. God owns it all. It's all God's. You're going to see in a few moments what happens. Stop sinning and do what's right. Break from your wicked past and be what? Merciful to the poor. Are we merciful to the poor? The least of these? We should be. Perhaps then you will continue to prosper. But all these things did happen to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, he was taking a walk. Twelve months. He was warned. Are we warned in our culture? The Bible says his kindness leads to repentance. That was kindness. God gave him a chance. God's given you a chance. He's given me a chance. These are prosperous times. The Bible says he's not slow in his second coming, but the reason he slows down, he wants all to be saved. So 12 months later, he's walking on his palace roof. You saw how beautiful it was. And Babylon, as he looked across the city, he said, look at this great city of Babylon. By my own mighty power, I did it. Thank you. It's like, name that tune. If you don't know what that is, we'll I'll talk after. But my own mighty power, I have built this beautiful city as my royal residence to display my majestic splendor. What did Satan say? I will lift myself above the highest star. I, 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 I. Me, 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 right? While these words were still in his mouth, a voice called down from heaven. O oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, this message is for you. You are no longer ruler of this kingdom. You will be driven from human society. You will live in the fields with the wild animals, and you will eat grass like a cow. Seven periods of time will pass while you live this way. You will be driven from human society. You will live in the fields with the wild animals, and you will eat grass like a cow. I'm going to show that picture. Seven periods of time. So what happens? Seven periods of time while you live this way until you learn, until you learn that the Most High rules over the kingdoms of the world and he gives them to whoever he chooses. For seven years, he's out of his mind. Have you ever wondered what's going on in our culture today? Why are we out of our minds? Why, and listen, this, please understand, I'm ready to say you can take offense to it. Please do not take offense. Let me just preface it by this. I thank God for medical science I thank God for pharmaceuticals. I thank God for psychologists, psychiatrists, and all that. Praise God for that. Okay? But the number one medication, according to what I've read, in America are antidepressants, anti-anxiety medication. Thank God for that. It helps people. All right? I, I'm not against it. Why is that the case? Why? Could it be? 
that we're trying to control everything instead of letting God control it? Could it be that we are tiding, we, we, we are going insane? Let me say something very, very important. When you're in charge and you live your life you're in charge, you are on the pathway to insanity. So why is it a 12-year-old boy wants to gather ammunition to go to school, and is that not insane, everybody? Is that not out of your mind? Why would someone do something like that? Why? Because our culture is clinically going insane. It's starting to happen in the perimeters. Some of the weakest people of our culture are falling prey to the violent culture we have because we want to be God. I'm going to do it my way. I'm God. My money, my church, my family, mine, mine, mine. And my friends, what that does is it deteriorates your spirit. It deteriorates your mind. And literally, I'm not making this up, you pull Jesus out. We talked about it in our biblical series. The spirit of Christ holds it all together. You pull Christ out of your mind, you're going crazy. Why are the crazy things happening today? Now, I'm not suggesting that someone has mental illness it's because of sin. I, ultimately, it's sin. I'm not suggesting that. Please understand what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is we're not designed to own. We're designed to be on loan. So that same hour the judgment was fulfilled and Nebuchadnezzar was driven from human society. He ate grass like a cow. He lived this way until his hair was long as eagle's feathers and his nails were like bird's claws. You can change the slide now, thank you. After this time had passed, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven. Yeah. My friends, all you have to do is look up to heaven. Look at the stars. We're a dust particle in the universe. Do you realize that? We think we know everything? What, are you kidding me? We think we know more than God? And so when he looked up, he looked up into the heavens and he saw the stars. The Bible says the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. There's a sermon every time you walk outside. There's a sermon when a baby is born. There's a sermon, I mean, there is a God. Anyone that says there's not a God is a fool. How can you say that? The Bible says that. How can a cement truck, a nail truck, and a lumber truck crash and build this church. That's insane. Yet people believe there's no God? That's insanity, everybody. It's the pathway of clinical ins insanity. After this time had passed, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven. My what? Sanity returns. You want you get your sanity back? Look up to heaven. Don't look to the government. Don't look to your church. Look up to who? God. Now, if, if we help you look up to heaven, that's good. But if you look here only, it's trouble. See, the body's fine, but you have to talk to the head. My sanity returned, and I praised and worshipped the most. How does, wait, 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 wait a minute here. How did he get his sanity back? What did he do? Um, what did that say? Praise. What does praise mean? Open up the doors. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. He praised God. He praised exuberant praise. That's part of our sanity is to worship God. Because if you don't worship God, you're going to find something else to worship. And when you worship God, you are aligning your psyche, your mind, your body to the tune of heaven. People are worshiping today in a couple of hours watching football. There's worship going to go on. Why not worship what's forever? Yes, thank you. Do you realize when you worship God, you're worshiping with those who have gone before you? I, just, I, I tell people this all the time. When someone dies and they're in heaven, every time we spend time with God and worship, we're joining with Moses, Abraham, my nana and poppy, Don, who passed away this past week. When we worship, we're joining in heaven with those people. You're created for worship, everybody. I praise and worship the Most High God and honor the one who lives forever. His rule is everlasting, and his kingdom is eternal. All the people of the earth are nothing compared to him. He does as he pleases among the angels of heaven, among the people of the earth. No one can stop him or say to him, 
What do you mean by doing these things? When people say to you, how dare you say that? I don't care what you think or say. I will follow God because his ways are true. Your words and opinions are nothing more than a quick mist of wind. When my sanity returned to me. Guys, don't you want your sanity back in this insane world? The pressure mounting. I, I, I got so much credit card debt. The average American is $8,000 of credit card debt. I, I, listen, I'm not against anyone here. Please understand that. Please, please, please. But when you have all this on you, you're trying to live for materialism. You're trying to live the American dream. And you've got this heavy yoke upon you. You're trying to compare yourself to other people. You're trying to be happy. And you're so loaded down. You go to sleep at night. You can't relax. Your mind is always going. I have to control everything. You can't control everything. Only God can. That's the insanity of it all. The first road to recovery from being insane is to realize it's only by his name that anything happens. I can't control it. And listen, I struggle with it too. I start feeling pressure. Wait a minute, God. Wait, holy God. These are your children. This is your church, God. So show me how I'm going to get out of this one, God. My advisors and nobles sought me out, and I was restored as the head of my kingdom with even greater honor than before. Why? He just told us a sermon. Nebuchadnezzar told us a sermon. None of us are as rich as he is, or he was, but he learned. He learned. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and glorify and honor the king. Are we praising? What do we sing these songs for? Let um, me get through the preliminaries. No, it's part of the worship here. You should worship God. I don't, I'm not an emotional person. Okay, let me ask you a question. Those of you who are married or boyfriend or girlfriends, um, if I tell my wife, um, I love you, I'm not an emotional person. I'll have not, we'll have none of this, none of that. Did I tell you I married a nun? My wife said, I'll have none of this, none of that. Okay. But seriously, what is a relationship without intimacy? A distant father, a husband and wife, they're frigid towards each other. Is that a marriage? Then why is it we think it's appropriate to show no emotion towards God? The Bible says, I will worship God with all my heart, my mind. It doesn't mean you have to be a nutcase. But I'd rather be a nutcase case for God than in a nut house. Amen. Have I offended you? I am sorry. <laughs> now, now Nebuchadnezzar prays and glorify and honor the king of heaven. All his acts are just and true, and he's able to humble the proud. Now, I want to bring you to something. There's something going on in our culture today that the book of Romans talks about in Romans chapter 1. And I'm going to let the scriptures... And by the way, have you noticed today that a lot of scriptures... Yeah, I, I happen to believe the Bible's true. And, uh, and I can say my opinions all I want, but when I read and preach the word, there's power. There's power beyond me. I'm telling you right now, you don't want to hear my opinions. I do give my opinions and what I think, but when I, this is scripture. This is not something that I just thought up. And as a matter of fact, I'd rather not read the scripture because it's hard, but it brings life. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. Do you know what an antidote is to insanity, partially? Being thankful. Being thankful. When you're thankful, it's hard to be angry when you're thankful. It's hard to be thankful. I mean, it's hard to be angry when you're thankful. It's hard to be depressed when you're thankful. Now, please understand me. If the enemy's whispering in your ear, see, you're a sentinel. No, stop out. No condemnation zone here, everybody. Please don't think that, okay? Listen to what this says. They knew God, but they would not worship him as God. Worshiping him as God. In other words, I control, not God. Worship is prostrating yourself towards something. Am I prostrating myself towards my, my own control, my own house, my own kids, their sports careers? They're going to be a, a star soccer player? Or star baseball player, or football player, or an honor society, the next road scholar. That's all it's about is my kids, 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 kids. Is that what it's about? No. But they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him what? Thanks. An antidote to health is being thankful. And they began to think up foolish ideas. 
When you're not thankful, what happens? It's mine. You start getting jealous of other people. You start getting uh, competing against one another. Uh, I, that's not fair. And you start, instead of being content, you start being uh, uncontent. And what happens? You don't get, you have not because you ask not. And when you do ask, you ask for the wrong reasons. What causes wars? Is it not your desires in you? You, you lust, but you do not have. But if you're thankful, you begin to think of foolish ideas of what God is like. Well, God wants me happy. God wants me this. God wants me that. And God, you know, after all, we've evolved as a culture. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Does God want our minds to be dark and confused? No. How does our mind become dark and confused? You're not thankful. You don't honor God. All you do is complain. I don't have this. I don't have that. I don't have this. All you do when you complain is like you're punching yourself. Imagine you have a sore arm. Oh, my arm hurts. Ow, it hurts. That's what you do when you complain. It's the most useless and the most unproductive thing we do, and I do it too. But when I thank God, thank you, God. And they began to think of foolish ideas of what God was like. Well, God thinks it's okay. You can do whatever you want to do as long as you don't hurt anybody. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. There's a lot of confusion today. There's a lot of darkness today in people's minds. Claiming to be wise, instead they became utter fools. Instead of worshiping the glorious ever-living God, they worship idols made to look like Mercedes-Benz. Oh, sorry. They look like mere people and Tesla trucks. Oh, and birds and animals and reptiles. So God did what? Abandon them. Have it your way. The worst thing that God can do to us is give us up to ourselves. Because without God, you're going to self-destruct. Period. Remember we talked about the Spirit of Christ holds the universe together? Pull Jesus out? It all crumbles. So God abandoned them to do whatever their shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. Do we see vile and degrading things happen with people's bodies today? Absolutely. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. That is why God abandoned them to do what their shameful desires wanted. Uh, just to do what your desires want. I want to do it my way is one of the worst things you could ever do. Because how do you, you don't, uh, listen, I, I hate to tell you this. What do you and I know compared to God? Really, right? That's why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turn against the natural way to have sex and instead indulge in sex with each other. You can't say that. I'm not saying it. The Bible says it. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lusts for each other. Men did shameful things with other men, and as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. This is what the Word of God is saying, everybody. Since they thought it was foolish to acknowledge God. See, it's not about the behavior. It's about not acknowledging God. You don't acknowledge God. There are symptoms of a disease. A disease, things begin to fall apart. You start seeing the, um, the repercussions of that aspect. And this is a list of the repercussions. Problem is, we're all guilty of it. So let's just continue. Since we're on a roll here. God abandoned them to do their foolish thinking and let them do things that should not be done ever be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness. Let's not just pick certain sins that we don't have a problem with. Listen to this list here. All of us fall into this one. A wickedness. Sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling that happened at the dining room uh, Thanksgiving table. Deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They're backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning. Have you noticed that, everybody? And they just dis dis disobey their parents. Now I like that one. They refuse to understand, break their promises, and are heartless and have no mercy. Who would ever dreamt of people in our own country going into places and lighting them up with, with firearms and killing people? If you told me that 30 years ago, I'd say you're out of your mind. That's the problem. We're out of our minds. God is giving us up. He doesn't want to. 
They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die, yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them as well. Uh, now comes Romans chapter 2. I don't like this part. I wish we'd stop right there. But look what the Apostle Paul does next. You may think you can condemn such people, but you're just as bad and you have no excuse. My friends, before we point out the word, by the way, let me just tell you something. Unbelievers, that's their job, to act like unbelievers. I'd rather hang out with a transvestite that's struggling with, with drug abuse than a pompous, haughty pastor any day of the week. Now, I'm not saying it's right. And so God is about reaching people. No matter who you are or what you've been through. So you may think you can condemn such people. But you're just as bad and you have no excuse. When you say they are wicked and should be punished, you're condemning yourself for you who judge others do these very same things. Now why do we do these things? Because the same progression is the same for everybody. Instead of acknowledging God, we deny God. Instead of being thankful, we complain. Instead of serving the creation, creator, we begin to worship the created creation. And we live for things and people instead of God. We begin to take ownership. You're not designed to own anything. You're only designed to be a steward. If you think you own, you're going to do it alone, and you're going to be messed up, and you're going to live a life of insanity. And taken to its, its ultimate course, it's destruction. This is what the Word of God says. So, we're all guilty of the insanity of pride. I think, we should have, I think we should have a parade of humility. Imagine that. Imagine we'd be humble as a church. Imagine we would not point our fingers at everybody and say, you're going to hell, but say, and have compassion upon them and care about them, realizing that if not for God's grace, none of us could stand. That's what God wants to do. He's looking for people like you and I that will stand up. Do we have to go insane first, everybody? Do we have to lose our minds as a culture? Or can we be the sanity that people are looking for? Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. The American dream is not God's dream. It's not. The pursuit of happiness is not. That's our God in America. I have to be happy. It's all about happiness. No, it's about holiness, everybody. The American dream is not God's dream. In fact, I just wanted to quickly go through this. I mentioned it in passing last week. When I read this passage of Scripture, this sounds like what we want, all want to do. And he told them a parable saying, this is Jesus, the land of a rich man produced plentiful. Okay? And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have nowhere to store my crops. Let me, get it. Let me rent a pod someplace. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns, and I will build larger ones, and I will store all my grain and all my goods. Now, what's wrong with that, everybody? It's not what we want to do. I want to put some away for a rainy day. I want to save my money. I want to have a 401k. I want to have a retirement plan. Uh, there's nothing wrong with those things, but this is what this guy was doing. All right? And I will say to my soul, what a wonderful life. Okay. <laughs> and I'll say to my soul, soul. You have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry, and call your financial advisor and thank him for all the commission he got. Is that not what we all want, everybody? Come on, let's be honest. Yeah. What does Jesus say? But God said to him, fool! Exclamation point. This night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared Whose will they be? Can you see that living the American dream to get a retirement account on this planet is foolishness? It's not foolishness to take care of yourself. It's not foolishness for lazing up treasure for your kids' kids. I'm not talking about that. But I'm saying if our aim is in this planet, it's vanity upon vanity. It's foolishness. So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. It's okay to have plans. It's okay to put money away. It's okay to take care of your parents. It's okay to lay up money for your grandchildren. That's godly. Understand that. But if that's the only goal you have, it's demonic. We have to be rich towards God. It's as God's, not mine. And it's easy, by the way, to say it's all God's when you don't have much. And there's a reason why God withholds a lot of 
material possessions from us and, and wealth from any of us. It's his grace. Because he knows we can't handle it if we had it. The psalmist, the proverb says, don't give me too much where I forget you and don't give me too little where I steal. But just give me what I need. Anyone who lays up for treasure for himself is not rich towards God. And he said to his disciples, therefore I tell you, this is the same passage, do not be anxious. Why do we do these things? We're anxious. I don't trust God. He doesn't have my best interest in mind. I got to become God because he's not being God. You're not designed to be God, everybody. If you're designed to be God, you'll drive yourself crazy. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. This Wednesday, we have Grant Sloan will be here. And I just talked to him last night, one of our missionaries. He talked about his father went through such difficulty. He said, Dad, how do you do it? He says, it's not my life. It's God's. It's so freeing when you realize that. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. What you eat, about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens that neither sow or reap. They have neither storehouses nor barns, uh, and yet your God feeds them. Oh, how much more value are these than these birds? God, look what your neighbor said. You're more, you're more valuable than a bird. Tell your neighbor you're more important than your dog. Tell your neighbor, I don't have a dog. Okay, I'm stop. <laughs> and which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his life? Listen, I, we all struggle with it, everybody. But when we realize it's all God's, it's not mine. It's not my life. God, it's yours. I want to be faithful. Thank you, Father. You've entrusted me with this. With the vision comes a provision. God will give me the strength I need. But if I tra we've trained our mind to think it's ours, it's going to take some time to rewire ourselves. But every day, allow yourself to marinate in God's word. And slowly but surely, you'll begin to change, and I will begin to change. But if God so clothes the grass which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? Faith. And do not seek what you're to eat and what you're to drink. Nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things. Do they not? What a crazy, crazy world we live in. And your father knows that you need them. Instead, seek whose kingdom? His kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Fear not. You see, a lot of anxiety and fear control us. That's the truth of the matter. We don't trust God. We don't think he has our best interest in mind. We got to do it for, we got to help God out. That causes anxiety. Then we make bad choices, which causes anxiety. Can you see the, can you see the whole pattern, everybody? Okay? Fear not, little flock. It's your father's good pleasure to what? Give you the kingdom. I'd rather have the kingdom of God than the kingdom of this earth. In a moment, it's gone. I was reminded of that this past week. A healthy man who loves God, he's with God. No one had any inclination that he would pass on to go to heaven. You'd never know it. As healthy as anyone here this morning. So we thought. But God, he's now in heaven. Praise God for that. Still breaks our hearts. You don't know when your time is up. What do you have to show for it? What do I have to show for it? Fear not, little flock. It's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. God wants to give you things. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. Remember how the whole progression started in Romans? Although they knew God, they did not acknowledge God as God, right? What do they do? They began to what? They weren't giving thanks. They became upset. They became jealous, and the whole progression began. You see, God wants to do good things things for you and I. God wants to release us from the insanity of this culture. You follow the enemy, your misery is, is going to be your address. You may not experience it on this planet, but eventually you will. It's God's grace that we go through difficult times, that we recognize that this is not our life. This is not all there is, everybody. We're passing through. My question to you and my question to me today is this. Who's the owner of your life? It's not about money. It's about control and ownership. 
What you own, you will do alone. What you steward, God will go through it with you. Are you willing to give up your life? Give up the insanity of this planet and say, Father, here I am. I am completely yours. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes.